Hey everyone, I'm making uh, a video here about the New Nation Unit Review, 7th uh, grade uh, U.S. History. We're going to touch on a bunch of topics today, including the Whiskey Rebellion, the Federalists versus the Republicans, the election of 1800, the resulting 12th Amendment, Thomas Jefferson, his Louisiana Purchase, Lewis and Clark, Marbury versus Madison, the Supreme Court decision, a little bit about Tecumseh, uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the Embargo Act and British impressment and how that led to the world, uh, the War of 1812, as well as the Monroe Doctrine. So first up is the Whiskey Rebellion. The Whiskey Rebellion happened right after uh, the country was formed. George Washington has been elected president, and it was the first real test to how is the United States government going to respond to an issue. Well, here's the little background. Uh, we had farmers in western Pennsylvania. Uh, who grew uh, crops that were a lot of times turned into liquor, whiskey in particular. Uh, the farmers in uh, this area did not like a new tax that was levied by the U.S. government on uh, corn and other uh, crops that were used to, that were converted to whiskey. And the new tax made their trade expensive. They didn't they didn't like this, so they rebelled. They took up arms, and they attacked several tax collectors, and it was a big issue in western Pennsylvania. Washington has to do something, so Washington responds by sending in the militia to Pennsylvania, quickly breaks up the rebellion. It's the first time that the military is used to put down an uprising within inside the United States. Washington's quick response proves to the Americans the government's going to act firmly and would not tolerate acts of violence such as the Whiskey Rebellion. So then we uh, go into the Federalists versus the Republicans. It's the two main political parties that are kind of created uh, after George Washington leaves office and specifically says, do not create political parties. It will only lead to infighting. It's not good for the United States. They do exactly what he says not to do, and they create uh, political parties. So the two main parties are the Federalists and the Republicans. The Federalists are led by Alexander Hamilton. They view the Constitution as a uh, loose document that allows for things to be uh, put in place, even if it doesn't specifically say it, as long as it goes with the intentions of the Constitution. We call that a loose interpretation of the Constitution. Supporters of Federalists include merchants, manufacturers, landowners, okay, kind of the wealthier people, the people that are uh, buying and selling and trading and owning land. Uh, they believed in an industrial economy. Cities should be the center, all about producing, manufacturing, and they believed that the goal of capitalism was the government should help businesses, okay? The government helps businesses is what they believed. The Republicans on the other side, led by Thomas Jefferson, they had a strict interpretation of the Constitution. Only what the Constitution says is allowed. If it's not in there, it's not allowed. Supporters included farmers, frontier settlers, shopkeepers, kind of the more everyday folk. They uh, viewed the society and the economy as being farm central, all about the farms and what is being produced on the farms in a rural area. And they believed in laissez-faire uh, capitalism, in which the government does not help businesses. Hands off, the government does not get involved, which is different than what the Republic or the Federalists said. The election of 1800 uh, pitted uh, Jefferson, Burr, Adams, Pickney, and Jay against each other. Okay, Back then, the Electoral College voted uh, for uh, just in one election. It was everyone against everyone else. Whoever came in first became the president. Whoever came in second became the vice president. This created some interesting dynamics because you could have a president from one political party and a vice president from a different political party. Also, we find out the other downfall of this system is that what happens if you have a tie? Okay, And that's exactly what happened. Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, they tie. They each get 73 votes, and they have to decide, uh, Congress has to decide who becomes president. Spoiler alert, they pick Jefferson. 
So as a result of the election of 1800, where there's this tie, the 12th Amendment to the Constitution is passed in which the Electoral College of electors would vote separately for president and vice president, meaning that one group of people are running for president, the other group is running for vice president. Whoever gets the most in each of those separate elections becomes the president and vice president. And what usually ends up happening is a presidential candidate teams up with a vice presidential candidate and they run together. Jefferson. Jefferson is president and uh, he's presented with an opportunity. He wants to expand the country westward, west past the Mississippi. Uh, he's interested in the Louisiana Territory. Specifically, he's interested in New Orleans, which is the city at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And if he can control that, he can control access to the West, and he feels that's very important to the United States. So he sends representatives to France to try and negotiate with Napoleon to secure buying at least the city of New Orleans and as much of West Florida as possible. He sends them with $10 million. When they get there, Napoleon, who is desperate for money, he has lost the ability to control Louisiana from Haiti, uh, and he needs the money from uh, this sale. He offers instead to sell all of Louisiana, the entire Louisiana territory, for just $15 million. They talk with Jefferson. Jefferson says, yes, let's do it. Uh, and he negotiates uh, this Ter this territory to be purchased by the United States. It doubles the size of the United States. It makes the United States drastically bigger. We have control of New Orleans. We have control of the Mississippi River. That is important. Uh, so now Jefferson picks some guys to go on a little bit of a fact-finding mission. mission. We're not sure what exists in this Louisiana Purchase. We know there's Native Americans that live out there, but we don't know the landforms. We don't know if there's a water route to the Pacific. So he, he picks two guys, Meriwether Lewis and his friend William Clark, and they set off together. Their goal is to, one, search for a westward water route to the Pacific, two, to interact with Native Americans that live in the Louisiana Purchase, and three, to document everything that they see, the land, the animals, the plants, Everything that they see, they, he wants to know all about this land that the United States just purchased, the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, Lewis and Clark uh, secure uh, from a Native American tribe, Sacagawea. Sacagawea is a Shoshone Native American. She is captured as a child. She lives with the Hidatsa tribe. She agrees or is forced or is bought, not sure. Uh, so basically, she joins Lewis and Clark's uh, journey. And she serves as a guide and interpreter for Lewis and Clark, which is very, she becomes very uh, important because she is that first link uh, to talking to Native Americans because she knows more of the languages. Uh, back in Washington, uh, there's an issue with appointing of judges. In 1803, we have a Supreme Court case, Marbury versus Madison. Uh, the Supreme Court says that the Judiciary Act of 1789 rules it unconstitutional because it gives the Supreme Court authority. It was denied by Article 3 of the Constitution. This is the first time the Supreme Court strikes down a law because it's unconstitutional. As a, as a result, it's the beginning of what the practice we call judicial review, and that is where the Supreme Court can look at uh, court cases and decide or look at laws that have been passed by the legislator and decide uh, are those laws constitutional or unconstitutional. Tecumseh. Tecumseh is a Native American uh, leader. He's a Shawnee warrior. He does not like that the United States settlers are encroaching on their land and he wants to unite Native Americans to fight back against the settlers that are moving into this area. The goal is to save Native American land, save Native American culture. That is Tecumseh. The British and the French start making the United States very angry. The British begin their policy of impressment, and that is where they would capture American merchant ships heading with goods to Europe, to France, to England, and they would force, kidnap the American sailors and force them to work on their ships. They would also seize the cargo. Angry, uh, that 
the United States is tra trying to trade with both England and France. France also begins to attack ships that they believe are headed to the British. This is all happening because the British and the French are fighting another war in Europe. So the United States takes a step to try and stop all of this taking of our ships, taking of our sailors. They passed the Embargo Act in 1807, which, is, which bans U.S. ships from trading with any other country. We said, fine, we're not going to trade with France and we're not going to trade with England. Well, that does hurt England and France, but it actually hurts the United States economy more because now our companies are not able to make money and as a result, they, we lose a lot of money. So the U.S. economy is hurt the most by the Embargo Act. It's a massive failure. It eventually goes away. So we're still upset, though, at what the British are doing. They're taking our sailors. They're taking our ships. And a group of congressmen, young congressmen, are starting to call for war. And they're known as the War Hawks. And the War Hawks really, really, really wanted the United States to go to war with England because they are taking our sailors, because they are taking our ships. The Warhawks want to go to war. And that's exactly what we do. We do end up fighting a war with uh, Great Britain. We call it nowadays the War of 1812. Back then it was called the Second War or the Second American Revolution because it kind of seemed like a continuation. Uh, the problem is the American army is very, very small and poorly trained. We didn't have advanced tactics similar to the Revolutionary War. We're not really prepared for this fight. Uh, so in the beginning parts of the war, that's exactly what happens. The British come in and they're winning the war until the Battle of Lake Erie. The Battle of Lake Erie is a very important victory for the United States. It gives the United States control of the Great Lakes. The United States Navy was uh, led by a guy named Oliver Hazard Perry. Oliver Hazard Perry is an American naval captain, defeats the British during the Battle of Lake Erie, which gives us control of the Great Lakes. Uh, the British uh, attack Washington, D.C. Uh, they burn the White House. They attempt to burn down other buildings, including the U.S. Capitol. James Madison, the president, is forced to evacuate. Evacuate His wife, Dolly Madison, stays behind and actually saves some very important documents and a big painting of George Washington from the White House before the British are able to come in and burn it. Uh, the British attack Fort McHenry uh, in Baltimore, and it's during that battle that Francis Scott Key writes the poem, The Star-Spangled Banner, which eventually becomes our national anthem. The Battle of New Orleans is fought at the end of the War of 1812. It actually happens after the United States signs the Treaty of, Grant, of Ghent, which ends the war and declares it a tie. Uh, Andrew Jackson wins a couple important battles during the War of 1812. He defeats the Creek Indians at Horseshoe Bend, and he also defeats the British at the Battle of New Orleans. His popularity increases. Andrew Jackson. The Treaty of Ghent, like I said, ends the war between Great Britain and the United States. The war is considered a draw or a tie. But the important thing is the United States has established itself as a power to reckon with. And Great Britain recognizes that they're no longer this new country. They have firmly established themselves and they are capable of uh, fighting in European style wars and doing quite well. Uh, James Monroe becomes president, and he wants to stop Europe from getting involved in North and South America. He wants to keep them over on the other side of the ocean. So he creates a document, a proclamation called the Monroe Doctrine. And the goal of the Monroe Doctrine is to prevent Europe from colonizing North and South America. Countries in South America, Mexico, were breaking free from their colonizers, uh, the countries, the mother countries in Europe, and they wanted, and Monroe wants to stop that. So that's the whole idea behind the Monroe Doctrine, is to stop Europe from colonizing uh, the Western Hemisphere, North and South America. Stay over in Europe. So that is a little summary of our unit. If you watch this a couple times, you'll do quite well on the test. All of these things are on the test. I created it, this video right from the topics that are on the test. So good luck. Watch my video. 
If you like my video, slap a like on it. Subscribe to my channel. There'll be more videos that will help you uh, on your tests.